But I want to start by giving you a little background for why the American Principles Project is sponsoring this event uh, and why we think um, this merits your attention and why we think this is really an important uh, policy discussion. So to put this into context for the American Principles Project, we were started seven years ago on a, a very simple idea, kind of the name gives it away, is that we were having an impoverished debate in America uh, politically, is that we were talking about policy, not about principle. We were reducing ideas to kind of their most practical form instead of talking um, in ways that the founders would have talked about, instead of talking at a higher level and elevating the debate. Um, I think at the time we didn't really fully recognize the extent to which this was really a path that the Republicans had set on, but not the Democrats. Uh, the Democrats were taking small ideas and making them big, winning elections and implementing the policies. The Republicans were taking big ideas and making them small, winning elections and not implementing the policies. So we had this, this series of elections over the last 30 years where we won half the time, the, the Republicans won half the time, the Democrats won half the time, and the agenda was the Democratic agenda and things just kept getting worse. Government kept getting bigger, and so what was happening? Um, you know, just winning the elect next election didn't seem like the solution. There was a, a, a bigger problem. So let me give you a sense in terms of what I mean, and I'm going to bring this back to money here pretty quickly so it makes sense in this context. Uh, Democrats would take a little idea like whether or not nuns are prescribing contraception. And they will go to the mat. And we, gosh, we have problems in America. It's not clear that this was the, the, the most pressing problem. But they would go to the mat on an issue of principle over exactly this. In this case, they lost, um, but they were willing to get into a suit with the Catholic Church over this issue. It's, a, it's unbelievable. You take Republicans and you give them a big issue. Let's say immigration. All right, that's a big issue. This goes right to the heart of what America is about. And they said, well, it's about it's a, secure the borders and um, it's about uh, a better workforce. We want higher qualified workers. It, it, at the end of the day, it's kind of really about money. It's about GDP growth. What's our workforce going to look like? It's the underlying principle is, if you ask them, and they'll say, well, the underlying principle is we want new people to come to America so that they can make the people that are already here richer. Okay, well, let's not do principle in that case, right? Let's do what else? Let's take education, right? We had a big debate about education in America over Common Core. This became a cause celeb, not just in Iowa, but in New York. And again, you go back and you ask the field, what is this really about? And they, well, it's about training this workforce. It's about uh, having better educated people that can you know, grow America, make our, our, our country more competitive against Korea. So again, it, they bring it back to money. They take a big idea about um, calling, uh, the purpose of life, um, and they make it about money. So then, all things being equal, we say, well, what if we actually ask them about money, right? Because that's what they're trying to talk about when we're talking about immigration and education. What if we actually ask Republicans about money? What's the, what's the really big principle? And now everybody doesn't want to talk, right? So now it's, well, oh gosh, this is the one thing none of us have experience with, because this is the one thing we've delegated to the experts. Jim Grant's, I think, perfectly apt phrase, the PhD standard here captures what policy is. So we have all of these politicians that have no experience with monetary policy, that want nothing really to do with it, have no programmatic solution, um, and so they offer us nothing. And so when I look at this program within APP, in many ways, um, this goes to the heart of the problem. We have a topic that is ever present that no one is ever really able to elevate to the point of principle. What is the purpose of money? What can it do? What can it not do? Can it make GDP grow faster? Can it create jobs? Or no? And if so, what are the limitations and what should we have? And this is exactly what George has, I think, done brilliantly here in this book. Um, and there's no better person to introduce him uh, to my mind than Jim Grant. Uh, who has been talking uh, and writing uh, eloquently and elegantly about uh, money now for the better part of 30 years. 100 years. 100 years, it seems longer. Um, his, uh, he talks like a writer, which I love, is that his, his newsletters, the Grants Interest Rate Observer that he started in 1983, I think, correct, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, Jim, um, is one of the most noticeably well-written um, uh, publications that I read. Uh, he is also a historian. He's being awarded tonight uh, the Hayek Prize by the Manhattan Institute. Larry Moen's here. This is incredibly good judgment, Larry. 
the book is uh, The Forgotten Depression. It's good enough to both be commended by the Manhattan Institute and, and criticized kind of shallowly by the New York Times. So that's high praise indeed. So Jim, uh, if you would, please come up and, 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 and introduce George. Well, thank you, Sean, and uh, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, what a pleasure it is indeed to introduce uh, George Gilder, the, the George Gilder, a kaleidoscopic a protean, a man for all decades, certainly all recent decades, uh, conservative sex books in the 70s, uh, wealth and poverty and President Reagan and the Republic of America in the 1980s, microchips and Qualcomm in the 1990s, intelligent design, knowledge and power, and Israel and God in the 2000s. Um, and now comes uh, the 21st century case for gold, a new information theory of money. Now here is a brilliant and delectable treatise on what money is and what it is not. Now what it is, George observes, is a measuring stick. Uh, what it is not, Federal Reserve please copy, is a magic wand. Um, the, uh, I got an advanced uh, copy of the proofs and I spent um, hours of, of pleasurable and thoughtful reading. I, I, I paid this my highest compliment. I, I, I couldn't stop posting it um, for all the aphorisms and all the brilliant uh, thinking in here. So this, this book I think is truly important and its author is truly delightful. George has unconvincingly ascribed his investment uh, success uh, mainly to luck with a residuum to overconfidence and uh, quote my prowess at the Blarney box. So George, uh, please step up to the Blarney box. <laughs> Jim, thank you. I mean, it is a great honor to be introduced by Sean and then by Jim Grant, who's uh, the best writer of economics. I, he's the John Kenneth Galbraith of, who actually uh, gets everything right. It's sort of an inverted version of John Kenneth Galbraith. That, with the same wit and wonderful elegance of style and uh, and this uh, um, unerring insight uh, what uh, Neil Stevenson in one of the books calls upside which is really beyond insight it's uh, a visionary uh, grasp of the integrated a range of uh, phenomena in the world. And, uh, I mean, there's so many friends here that I, I can't uh, really recite them all, but I should mention uh, Steve Forbes, who propelled me on this course. Because I have to say, when I began in Wealth and Poverty, I didn't quite know what I thought about gold. I circled around it, I probed it, I looked at it, uh, 79 protons, I, I uh, wondered why gold had uh, its really magical record as the monet monetary element. And, and uh, it never quite worked for me until I really began to scrutinize gold in the guise of information policy. I mean, information theory. And I spent 20 years in uh, Silicon Valley and around Silicon Valley studying information theory is a way to understand Qualcomm and and uh, all the comp Intel and all the companies of Silicon Valley and then it suddenly struck me 
that uh, information theory, because it defines information as surprise, provided a way of capturing entrepreneurial creativity within an economic model. And uh, no other, all the reductionist schemes that people apply to economics fail because they fail to capture creativity. And uh, Claude Shannon, the real founder of information theory, along with von Neumann and Gödel and Turing, uh, defined information as unexpected bits, as surprise. And uh, it had all, I'd, in, in Wealth and Poverty, I recalled that I had this quoted Albert Hirschman of Princeton. And uh, Albert Hirschman said, creativity always comes as a surprise to us. If it didn't, we wouldn't need it. And socialism would work. I added that line. <laughs> and, and it's, so here we have creativity as the essence of entrepreneurship and we have surprise as the uh, uh, creativity defined by surprise and information defined by surprise. And then the next step was to identify wealth. Uh, entrepreneurship is really creativity and surprise. Profit is surprise, profit and loss are the unexpected returns, the average returns are captured by the interest rate. So you move from uh, entrepreneurship and human creativity and the image of his creator as surprise, and then you identify wealth as knowledge. And we know wealth is knowledge because as Thomas Sowell told us decades ago, the Neanderthal in his cave had all the material resources we have today. The difference between our age and the Stone Age is entirely the accumulation of knowledge. So wealth is knowledge. And then the question is, how is this knowledge created? What is growth? And uh, growth is learning. This, uh, I've been preoccupied with learning curves and all for most of my uh, life as a writer. I'd encountered them with Bill Bain decades ago when he called me and said I'd greatly underestimated the impact of uh, lowering taxes, tax rates, and prices. That the impact of, of lower uh, prices was much more dynamic and complicated and cascades through the economy in a much more powerful way than I expected. Well, learning curves are ubiquitous in the economy. And what learning curves tell you is that Deflation, as it were, is the fundamental condition of capitalism. Learning curves tell you that for every doubling of total units sold, you get a 20 to 30 percent drop in cost. And this is, uh, so capitalism is based on steadily declining costs and prices. It, or, another way of putting it, steadily expanding value. Well, when, and, and uh, in all the inflation numbers, we have all these scrutin uh, scrutiny of uh, prices that uh, preoccupy the press are mostly bogus. Uh, prices go down, and uh, value goes up, and as a result of learning, and uh, that's, the, that's the heart of capitalist economics.
Well, if uh, capitalism is constantly producing new learning and abundance, what remains scarce when everything else grows abundant? What remains scarce when everything else grows abundant is the residual resource. And that residual resource is time. So if money, as Steve Forbes had taught me for years and years, is a measuring stick, uh, the, the, how, how can it be a measuring stick if it's part of what it measures? It has to have a root outside the system itself. This is a fundamental principle of information theory established by Kurt Gödel in a paper which was really the most important uh, breakthrough in 20th century of philosophy and logic when he showed that any logical system is necessarily dependent on uh, truths outside that system that cannot be reduced to the system. If you're going to have a measuring stick of economic activity, it can't be part of this economic activity. So I, so uh, this was confusing to me because people kept talking of gold as if it was money because it was valuable outside of its role as money. And somehow this confused me, how gold could be both part of the economy and the measuring stick of economic activity. And I really didn't get the key until um, Mike Kendall, I think, was the guy who really brought my attention to this idea of uh, money as time. It, uh, it gave a quote from Jude Winiski who was all over this argument. And uh, it allowed me to see that the reason gold is valuable and foundational is not because it has economic value, but because it doesn't have economic value, <laughs> really. Uh, as, as money, it's rooted in time because it uh, nullifies capital and technology. Really through happenstance, historically, uh, gold has become more difficult to extract and more costly to find and deliver in proportion as technology of mining has become more advanced. And that, uh, thus, uh, gold has nullified capital and technology, leaving itself as a manifestation of the time and a measure of the time that it takes to extract it. So it becomes a pure measure of time. And then, uh, going back to Silicon Valley, I encountered Bitcoin, where uh, Satoshi Nakamoto wrote a brilliant paper preoccupied with how to separate Bitcoin from the economy and make it a pure manifestation of time. That's essentially what the original Bitcoin uh, paper is doing. He understood, as uh, Nick Szabo, his colleague and possible uh, avatar, is... Uh, has also focused on this reality. So, uh, wealth is knowledge, growth is learning, and money is time. And that, those are the real foundations of an information theory of the economy. And uh, it's uh, the same theory 
that also underlies all the triumphs of computer science and microchips and bioengineering and uh, most of the great advances in the economy over the last decades have been uh, through of uh, the power of information theory, beginning with Gödel, uh, who was identified by uh, John von Neumann and uh, who in turn uh, translated it into computer science uh, with Turing, who uh, immortally declared that uh, a computer uh, could not be uh, is necessarily dependent on an oracle outside the computer. There's no way that the computer itself can become a mind or a brain. Uh, you can't, uh, the mind cannot be reduced to computation. And he was asked, well, what can this oracle be? And he said, well, the only thing I can say about the oracle is that it cannot be a machine. It must be a human being. It must transcend uh, the system. And, uh, and human creativity, which always comes as a surprise to us, and echoes the creativity at the foundation of the universe, is the creativity of the creator, is the foundation of all economics and wealth and growth and truth. Thank you. I, I hope all of you will take the time to read this this book and the profundity of this idea that that money is time is is, is something that's you know is I, I think a very deep philosophical concept a little hard to get your head around but I think has some very real and lasting real world implications which I want to give everybody a little dose of now we have found that at the American Principles Project that um, this bifurcation whereby you have Academics that write white papers that go on shelves and you have other people that give money that goes into campaigns that win elections That actually structurally is Doesn't work well and what you want to do is you want to bring the two of those things together which through our C3 and our C4 and our super PAC we try to do and so um, It matters more when you have a good idea when you have the right principle when you've made the right argument and there's a political reality um, to that argument and we're very fortunate today to have um, an individual who has done more to connect these two ideas, to connect money and politics, I think, than almost anyone else. Uh, Steve Forbes, who uh, I was reading his bio on the uh, uh, last night, and uh, um, the list of things that he's done is unbelievable. He's basically done things that everybody knows needed to be done, but everybody was afraid to do. Um, you cut taxes. You helped cut taxes in New Jersey. Um, Thank God for that, because there's still more to do uh, as, a, as a resident of New Jersey. Um, ran for president twice, um, has given us the enduring gift of the flat tax, which any observer of the current political contest in the Republican Party will know of the enduring legacy of that very, very good idea that is still a very big part of, um, of the current debate about taxation and has elevated monetary policy in politics over and over again, specifically uh, gold and the gold standard. So um, we are all, I think, even if we don't know it, very indebted uh, to Steve. And I, I'm, I'm very happy you're here today. Steve, if you would come up and please say a, a couple words about, um, about George's book, your thoughts on this, the thoughts on gold. Um, uh, we look forward to hearing from you. Well, thank you very much, Sean, for those very kind words. I think the real debt goes to uh, George Gilder and people like uh, Jude Winiski, who started these uh, campaigns way back in the 1970s and 1980s. And I uh, want to thank uh, Jim Grant for uh, your questions and for your introduction. So, Sean and Jim, thank you. George, thank you, and thank all of you. I'm uh, delighted for my free lunch today. Uh, saying, saying, saying a few words is no payment at all for anyone who's been in politics. But what, uh, what uh, I think the significance of what George has done is that we've now become part of his voyage of discovery. He's, he has fresh eyes and is giving a new perspective. 
I never thought of entropy related to monetary policy, but he, he, he has given it a, a wider perspective. And by properly placing sound money in the context of time, in the, the internet, with information theory, by giving a proper analysis of the Bitcoin phenomenon, George will be drawing others to this absolutely critical subject. This is a moral subject, and George hit on it. The blunt truth is, you can get taxes right, you can get regulations right, you can get spending right, but if you don't get the money right, if you don't get monetary policy right, you will be in trouble, because money does convey information. Now, in the 80s and 90s, we sort of had what you might call a sort of right, semi-sloppy, but sort of right, uh, monetary policy for much of the 80s and 90s. Uh, give it a C minus. Uh, given F, F, the 70s, that was pretty good. But, and uh, we, we saw phenomenal things happen. Uh, strong foreign and military policy, we won the Cold War, opening up vast swaths of the world to the glories of entrepreneurial capitalism. We saw trade and the flows of capital reach as a proportion of the global economy, levels not seen since 1913. 1913. Taxes were cut. The Brits did it first, but not quite right. Reagan did it, and by golly, 50 countries followed suit. So privatizations, we learned that word. The idea of government disgorging assets instead of gobbling them up. And 1913-1914 is critical, because these advances that we saw come to fruition in the 80s and 90s. We now saw in the last 15 years, these are precarious if people don't understand money, if prevailing economic theories are wrong. If those theories are wrong, inevitably, civilization will have threatening crises as we have today. They will erupt and malignant political forces will rise up. We saw this in the 1930s. We saw it again in the 1970s. We're seeing it again today. People get the sense that people in government don't know what to do, just as they had that sense in the 1930s. And so they, as these people, they don't know what to do, so they clutch ever more tightly to their idols and false gods. David Malpass, <clears throat> which uh, George references in his, in his paper, David Malpass has pointed to the quantitative easing, which they thought is stimulation, actually is crushing the economy, the equivalent of draining blood from an anemic patient and hurting the creation of small and new businesses, hurting the poor and middle class. And I shared George's distaste for this Marxist terminology, but that's the way it is today. And George understands and will be able to convince other people to understand that money is not in and of itself wealth. It is not a tool to guide economies like central planners envision. <clears throat> Economists have it backwards, proverbial cart before the horse. As George understood, money measures value. It is that measuring stick, just as clocks measure time, scales measure weight, and rulers measure length. And just as imagine, as we've done, and I've done it before, imagine if the Fed was in charge of clocks. Imagine floating clocks. Imagine how chaotic that would be. 60 minutes an hour one day, 48 the next, 92 the day after. Imagine baking a cake. It says, bake the batter 40 minutes. Well, you have to think, is that... Nominal minutes? Inflation-adjusted minutes? Is it a New York minute? A Mexican minute? And so, as George explains in this new book, money should be, what he calls low entropy, a conveyor of information and nothing more. And so, and think of it, be simplistic, it's a claim on products and services, just like a coat check in a restaurant is a claim on the coat. So a restaurant would no more think that by creating more coat checks, that will stimulate the production of coats and therefore more customers. That, in essence, the thinking passes for economic thinking in the world today. Coat check theory. <laughs> so, and sadly, and sadly, sadly, what they're doing is infinitely more harmful than a restaurant that gets it wrong. Because as George points out, unstable money hurts the greatest conveyor of information, which is prices how people value things. You know, it signals, it enables us to see what people want or don't want. It enables us to invest. Prices are absolutely essential. But unstable money 
corrupts that information like a virus in the computer corrupts the information. We saw that in the 70s, when oil went from three to forty dollars a barrel. Everyone thought the price is going up, nominal price, therefore we must be running out of this stuff. We had the same phenomenon in the last decade, oh, we're running out of the stuff, need alternative energies. Price signal was wrong, was corrupted. We saw it in housing. Housing prices were going up. So what happens when you have unstable money to base your money? Well, but people saw prices going up, oh, must not have enough houses. So we churned out more and more houses, invented a new mortgage, which was, why have an income? <laughs> you know, who needs